Cool. All right. I think it's about time to get started. All Sounds right. good. Okay, cool. Well, uh, thank you everyone for showing up. Today we have Kenneth Johansson, uh, CKDF member, and Smith. Uh, you do swords, blacksmithing stuff. What else do you do? Uh, I do a lot of wood and metal work. Uh, I've mm -hmm. only created one sword, so I'm still very much an amateur. Mm -hmm. So well, uh, let's go ahead and get here. this started. Yeah, he's here to talk to us about the evolution of the medieval sword. Take it away. Hey, so uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name's Kenneth Johansson. I'm an older member of the CKDF Fencing Club, but I don't really contribute to the club in any significant capacity. So this talk's a cool way for me to give back to the community. Um, like a lot of people, I work at a computer all day. So when I come home, I like to work with my hands. I do a lot of wood and metal work. Over the last five or six years, I've uh, been an amateur blacksmith. And it culminated this past February in me having an amazing opportunity to go out and take a sword making class with a, a well-known and respected bladesmith. Um, it was a ton of fun. I learned a ton of things. And I wanted to share some of that with you today, as well as some of the amateur research I've been doing into medieval swords. Uh, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get this started. Um, so swords have meant many things to many people throughout history. You know, swords can be a representation of war. They can be a symbol of power, an indicator of wealth. They can carry religious connotations. Uh, they could be a form of artistic expression. Or, you know, in the case of HEMA, we, we generally think of them as a means of self-defense. Um, for me personally, though, I like to think of swords as a technological innovation. Uh, one that's evolved over a few thousand years of human history. So I want to focus today on that kind of evolution and talk about some of the surrounding technological innovations of the medieval sword. Um, we're going to take kind of a shotgun approach to this. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of topics. Hopefully they're not too disjointed um, and we'll stop often to have open conversations. So the medieval longsword uh, as many of you know, the foundation of it is it is a steel object. Um, from a material science perspective, steel is just simply iron with a very specific amount of carbon. By modern standards, we declare that between 0.1% and 2% carbon content. So to talk about iron, let's go ahead and hop in our time machine and let's go back to the Iron Age. And to talk about the Iron Age, let's first talk about the end of the Bronze Age. So around 1100 BC, we have a Bronze Age collapse. Uh, this is a complete system collapse of all Mediterranean civilizations. Think uh, the Proto-Greeks, uh, the Minoans, the Hittites, uh, the Assyrian Empire, and to a large degree, the Egyptians. Anything that could go bad went bad. Uh, think earthquakes, so soil degradation from over farming, um, see people burning and pillaging, uh, you, you name it. So why are these cultures using bronze? Well, copper's fairly available. Um, tin's a little bit harder to get a hold of, but these civilizations have complex trade networks that facilitate uh, the acquirement of tin. Uh, and tin and copper is very easy to work with uh, to form bronze. Uh, copper melts around 1,000 degrees, Tin melts around 500 degrees. Uh, this means that it's very easy for craftsmen to use a wood fire to process or uh, to smelt it and to form Bronze Age implements. Um, the primary reason not to use iron is that uh, it's very hard to process. Uh, you need temperatures in excess of 3000 degrees to melt iron. And we really don't get those temperatures until kind of the early industrial era. Uh, but there's ways to work around that. So what happens when these civilizations collapse is it opens the door for new uh, cultures and new technologies to form, um, the most important of which is the working of iron. And by about 500 BC, all ports of the Mediterranean and continental Europe are, are in the Iron Age. Um, if you're not producing iron, uh, your neighbor is, and he's probably coming over to uh, raid and pillage your town. So why use iron? Well, iron is obviously much stronger than copper or tin, which makes up bronze. Um, even the softest wrought iron is about 1.5 times stronger than your, your average bronze implement. And it also, uh, iron is fairly plentiful. You can find iron deposits in most geographical regions. Uh, so you don't need things like these complex trade networks to start working with iron. So where are they getting these iron from? Well, 
Iron was no stranger to the ancient civilizations we just talked about. Um, they came into contact with meteoric iron and they made stuff from it, cool stuff. Uh, like down here we have a uh, meteoric dagger that was recovered from uh, King Tut's tomb. Um, these are very old and we have artifacts going all the way back to about 3000 BC. So this indicates that there's a large overlap between the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, you know. Steve down the street didn't suddenly have an epiphany one day and start making iron stuff. Um, it's something that these cultures knew about and it's something they used. But obviously meteoric iron is not very plentiful. So uh, what's kind of the first commodity source of iron that these cultures around the Mediterranean or uh, continental Europe came into contact with? Um, most likely it was bog iron. Bog iron is interesting in that it's a uh, iron oxide that forms at the bottom of swamps, um, peat bogs, really any low lying area that has a water feature. And all you do is you walk up and you can rake this stuff out of the swamp, out of these low lying areas. You can even excavate it if the land has dried up. Uh, and this is kind of what we think that the Celtics and the early Romans did. Um, the interesting thing about bog iron is that most bog iron is pretty poor. Uh, the actual iron content within it is usually around like 40, maybe 50%. Um, but a lot of people have theorized that the bog iron that's found in Northern Europe is actually very iron rich. We're talking like 60 to 70% iron content. So the next common source of iron that we see is uh, hematite ore. Uh, hematite is the most common ore that contains iron throughout the world. Uh, it's still the primary iron uh, ore that we excavate today in modern times. Um, we have a lot of prominent examples of this around the Mediterranean. A lot of the islands produced hematite ore. Um, probably the most famous is Elba, which was under Etruscan control early on. Um, they conducted like open pit mining of hematite ore. And later when the Romans took over, uh, we see like large scale mining operations. Um, first starting with like open pit mining and then moving on to shaft mining. And again, these technologies aren't really that new. Um, they did the same thing for copper and tin uh, gathering as well. Um, and we start seeing this ore uh, mine in other regions as the Roman Republic kind of forms into the Roman Empire. Uh, we see heavy iron uh, production in the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, we see heavy iron production in the Rhineland and uh, heavy iron production along uh, areas such as uh, modern day Hungary and the, the Danube. And these areas really will come to the forefront later on in the medieval area uh, era for iron production. Um, think of like famous cities like Toledo, Seville. Um, in Germany, we think of Passau or uh, Solingen. Uh, and, and these really are become kind of the, the primary cities that we think of for famous blades. But let's go ahead and talk more about ore. So like I said, hematite ore isn't really new to any of these civilizations. Um, the powdered form of hematite is interesting. It's uh, red ochre. Red ochre has been used for thousands of years as a paint pigment by this time. Um, you can go back into Neolithic cave paintings. Uh, they used this stuff uh, for a long time and gathered it. Um, it's also thought to have medicinal remedies. So we see um, hematite used in a lot of uh, medicine. And uh, some of these veins, the nicer veins, are actually considered a minor gem. Uh, we see this used in a lot of ancient jewelry. Um, especially like talismans coming out of Egypt. Uh, the other type of ore that we see used by ancient civilizations, um, particularly the Romans, is uh, siderite ore. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Again, I'm not an expert. Um, this stuff is pretty common around the Alps. Um, think of modern day Hungary. Um, there's still mining operations there that focus on this type of ore. It's not as common as hematite, um, but it's very easy to uh, process. Uh, so over here, uh, we talked a little bit about Roman mining operations. They really brought it to the next level. Um, we start seeing kind of an industrial scale level of mining when the Romans come along. Um, so here on the right, we actually have one of their aqueducts used for mining. This is the La Cabrera Aqueduct in Las Mendulas, Spain. This is in northern Spain. 
this is probably one of the biggest mines in the Roman Empire. Uh, it was a gold mine, and it consisted of seven aqueducts feeding the mine uh, with water for basic primitive hydraulic mining. Um, and this, is, this isn't this is small. I mean, these seven aqueducts cover about 70 miles uh, up mountains and so forth. Uh, so this was active during the first century AD. And today you can actually visit it as actually a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So you got iron ore. Uh, what do you do with it now? Well, uh, we can process it and smelt it. Um, so early on, uh, how you would smelt iron is you would use these small scale bloomeries, um, usually called Catalan or Corsican bloomeries. Um, these operate at relatively low temperatures, uh, so they're not able to fully melt iron, but they allow iron to coalesce into something called sponge iron, which is kind of a big spongy ball of iron that has a lot of the slag melted out of it still has some trace elements. What ends up happening is you and a bunch of your friends go in, you pull this sponge iron out and you hammer on it for a few hours uh, to get further impurities out and to refine it into wrought iron, uh, usually in like a bar billet. And then this raw form of iron can uh, then be used by a blacksmith to do um, production of basic implements. And what we see over time, uh, starting with the Romans and moving into the early medieval uh, era is we start seeing uh, these type of bloomeries increase in size. Um, we get things like the wool furnaces. Uh, these are pretty common in Northern Europe. Um, these are just an oversized bloomery. Uh, these are like 10 to 12 feet in size. Uh, this particular example, you know, we have a guy actually having to go up a series of stairs to put material in. And these would operate by using uh, iron ore, um, alternating layers of ore and uh, charcoal, uh, wood charcoal to burn down the material into sponge iron. Uh, and then we see an iteration of technology improvements, uh, such as using a slag pit. Uh, they would have had complex uh, bellows to power a lot of these. And by the time we enter the late medieval era, um, these really become monster truck size. Uh, these are the earliest blast furnaces. When we talk about technological innovations in the medieval era, uh, the blast furnace is probably the most important. Uh, blast furnaces allow for the efficient large scale production of quality iron and steel. And this is primarily because of the size and the amount of material that they're processing. They're able to get to high enough temperatures that they can start to really melt a lot of the impurities in the iron and produce raw manufactured iron, uh, which can then be processed further into workable material. Uh, we start seeing blast furnaces become widespread in the 13th century. Um, there are examples uh, going back to the 12th century, uh, but the areas that are really well known for them are Switzerland, um, parts of the Rhineland and Germany and Sweden. So uh, this enables uh, quality mono steels. So we get a wider production of like long swords, for instance. Um, this allows for uh, innovations such as plate armor to really come about. Um, and we, we see this in firearms as well for early cannon production. So fast forward a few hundred uh, years and we get even more complex heavy industry. Um, George Agricola uh, is an interesting fellow. He actually is, is one of the first Latin books to uh, discuss uh, metallurgy, prospecting, and mining. Uh, he himself was a, a German scholar and metallurgist. Uh, and in about 1556, he publishes his works uh, known as De Re Metallica. Uh, this is a volume of about 12 books discussing, again, prospecting, mining, and metallurgy. Um, and it's a great book because it contains a lot of these beautiful wood block prints. Um, this volume discusses a lot of sophisticated knowledge of engineering for the age and actually becomes an authoritative resource uh, for metallurgy for the next two or three centuries. Uh, sadly, he actually dies in 1556 before this is published. Um, he lives in a, a well-known mining village outside of Dresden, uh, which would have been Saxony back uh, in his time. He doesn't really go over the history of metallurgy and how some of these technologies form, but he does reference a lot of mines that have, are very old. 
Um, the city in which he dies is, is actually Kremnitz, um, which has mining operations spanning back about eight, 900 years from his time. So uh, late Roman, early medieval uh, era. So if we're looking at some of the woodblock prints, you know, we can see complex water management systems for pumping water out of deep mine shafts, uh, utilizing uh, a series of cranks. Uh, we see huge power wheels powering hoists, uh, early examples of trip hammers, as well as a whole array of furnaces uh, used for basic smelting. Uh, this example here is just a simple tin furnace. So I've covered a lot of information. Let's go ahead and take a stop here. Does anybody have questions, comments, concerns? Am I speaking too fast? Is everything okay? Uh, pace is good. Uh, we have a question from Connor. Uh, he asks, what characterizes a wolf furnace? Uh, so this is a an interesting thing because I can't find a lot of research on these. I can find a couple metallurgy journals and there's some uh, evidence, archaeological evidence of these things. Essentially, they are a large bloomery. Um, they're called wolf furnaces because they have a very large uh, exit for sponge iron and slag and so forth. Um, they're really just a, a big bloomery furnace. Cool. Um, also, uh, that blast furnace, um, to what extent, uh, uh, so like the, the steel, what, what fraction of it or what, what types of steel or iron are needed for swords as opposed to, say, armor or kind of general blacksmithing goods uh, versus sure. guns? Um, that's a good question. Let me think of how, okay, let me, uh, let me pull another slide. I have another talk kind of talking about that. Let's see here. I guess the, the reason I ask is because a lot of the towns that are known for making swords aren't necessarily the same same ones that are known for making armor and yeah so i've noticed that too and i don't have a good example of that but i can give you some more information yeah oh and then joe has a question back again about the uh, the wolf furnace once we're done <laughs> sure so let's talk more about iron and exactly what steel is so by the time blast furnaces roll about, uh, you produce tons of charcoal and iron ore that's been processed, usually through a trip hammer. Uh, so they've been refined into this blast furnace. And over the course of potentially a few days, you start melting it down and you continuously add uh, charcoal and more ore to it. And what ends up happening is you produce something called pig iron. So you burn off impurities, you burn off slag, you divert it and you get this raw manufactured form of iron that you then pour into trenches. Uh, these trenches are called piglets, uh, just because they look like pigs uh, sucking at their, their mother's teeth. Um, this term is still used today as a kind of a raw uh, form of unmanufactured iron. Um, pig iron has a really high iron content, usually a really high carbon content, sorry, uh, in excess of 5%. So what that means is that you actually need to refine this iron by burning off some of this carbon. Uh, usually you'd have a secondary f uh, blast furnace uh, like implement or something uh, along the lines of a puddling furnace uh, that would help refine this. Oh. And I was just handed a note that I'm actually not sharing my screen. Oh yeah, I was wondering. <laughs> I am so sorry. I'm good. Thank you. Sorry, my fiance pointed that out. So I just spent five minutes talking about. No, it, it silly made stuff. sense. So, uh, so blast furnaces produce pig iron, right? Uh, that iron has a, a high carbon content in excess of five percent. Uh, this iron is pretty much unworkable. Uh, you refine it by putting it through things like a puddling furnace, which burn off some of that carbon content, and you get cast iron. 
Uh, cast iron isn't something you can easily forge. Matter of fact, if I put a cast iron skillet in a forge and hit it with a hammer, it would shatter. Uh, that amount of carbon makes the, the iron very hard, but very brittle. So you continue to burn off uh, that carbon. And when you get between 0.1% and 2%, you have steel. Um, and this is something you can actively forge. And this is something that would have been used for quality products such as swords, uh, knives, um, armor, um, pretty much all arms in armor production is this is what you're after. And then if you keep refining it, uh, you get wrought iron, which is kind of the traditional uh, material that a blacksmith would use. And this is relatively pure iron. It does have some slag in it, which makes it kind of weather corrosive or uh, makes it corrosion, corrosion resistant uh, would be a good way to look at it. Uh, it's very soft and easy to work with. Um, wrought iron actually isn't produced nowadays just because it's so manually intensive to create. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. And, and, and uh, in, that, in that time, we've been, we've been hit by a ton of other iron uh, questions about iron. Um, was sponge iron more abundant or was it the easier to initially work with? So sponge iron isn't something you go out and you mine. Uh, sponge iron is created by partially melting a bunch of ore in a bloomery. Uh, let me see if I could find a quick picture of it. Yeah, I can't find anything on Google. Uh, just go through YouTube and uh, type in sponge iron and you'll see people today that do recreations of bloomeries. What ends up happening is they, they spend a couple hours, they burn down all the ore and material. Again, like a, a large blast furnace, they remove the slag, uh, but these don't get hot enough to actually melt the iron. So what happens is it coalesces into this kind of football, basketball sized chunk of rock that you then take out by creating a big hole. And then you and a couple other guys take hammers to it and you beat the crap out of it and you beat out impurities and it actually uh, condenses down into a workable billet of iron or steel. Um, what would happen during these early times is if they had ran these too long is they would produce cast iron, which again has that high carbon content. Um, they really had no way to, uh, to refine that. So this was actually a throwaway material for a lot of these early bloomeries. Uh, that, that's actually a good segue into Will's question, which is, uh, I've never understood how simply hammering bloomery iron purifies it. Uh, could you explain how that happens or what's going on there? Yeah, so there's something called decarburization. Um, the longer you heat iron, uh, the more carbon you burn off of it. Um, it takes a long time. Uh, to do this. Uh, the second way to remove carbon is by uh, actually uh, working it physically with a hammer. Um, this isn't as productive as just simply burning it off, uh, but slowly uh, carbon will escape the material that you're working on. Uh, this is an important thing to, to think about when you're making knives nowadays. All right, so the last question which Joe asked uh, originally was, uh, there's a guy in the middle picture. Uh, I think it's in the, in the next slide or the, the slide after that. Uh, he's working two levers. Oh yeah, I see him. Oh he's kind yeah. Of on, he's kind of in that little balcony just like with two, two levers. W what, what's he up to? What's, what's his story? I have no idea. <laughs> uh, I, I, you'd have to go pull the appendix from this. I assume that there's a, a water flute coming in here and these levelers control which way this wheel is actually turning. So if you look, there's uh, two slides here going in either direction. So water is probably pumped in one direction, which turns the wheel one direction, and then uh, the other direction would turn the wheel in the other direction. So you could lower oh, yeah. and, and raise this hoist. Oh, yeah, it's got that caption there. Oh, man who directs the machine. Oh, That's okay. not helpful at all. My, my eyesight's really bad. I didn't even notice that, so... I no, I mean, invest in some glasses. It has the appearance of being useful, but really isn't. Yeah. He directs the machine. Okay. Oh, and the the C and D labels just call them levers. Yeah, great. It's also yeah. unhelpful. The other thing to keep in mind, like these books are originally written in Latin, and you know, just like a lot of old time uh, 
uh, books and material, a lot of the talk is very confusing to modern day speakers. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, also, this, these books were translated like two or three different times. So I think the pictures I have actually come from the 18th century translation. Mm. Uh, so these are like rudimentary photocopies. I see. Cool. All right. Well, answered all the questions. Sure. So let's uh, let's continue. So so let's let's talk about what we all came here to talk about, which is swords. So if we're talking about the evolution of the medieval uh, sword, uh, we have to talk about his granddaddy, which is the Roman spatha. Um, so Rome comes into contact with a lot of Celtic cultures when it starts conquering the Iberian Peninsula around the second or third century BC. And like the Romans do, uh, they steal all the good ideas. Um, so the gladius is actually a Celtic weapon that's used. Uh, the Romans quickly adopted as a, the fighting man's uh, infantry weapon. Uh, we're all familiar with the gladius probably, but we're not as familiar with the spatha. Uh, the spatha is also a Celtic weapon uh, that the Romans adopt. Um, first, the Roman cavalry looks at it and uh, adopts it immediately uh, because smiting people from horseback with a 20-inch blade is difficult. Uh, so they, they really go for that length. Uh, let's see. So the interesting thing is we think the Romans used the gladius throughout like the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire era, and that's actually incorrect. Over the next four centuries, uh, the Roman infantryman actually adopts the spatha as the primary uh, fighting weapon. Uh, and just like throughout uh, any, any point in history, um, during war, uh, the sword is actually a secondary weapon. So over here on the left, we actually have a famous tombstone from a, a Roman cavalryman from the first century AD. Uh, this is in Germany. And we can actually see that he has a spatha strapped to his side and he's uh, hefting some sort of pole weapon. Uh, looks like a spear. So the interesting thing is the, the late Roman infantryman adopts the spatha. We don't know why. There's no historical records giving us an indicator. Um, but there are a couple of theories. Um, it could be due to the length of the weapon. People just favored it over time. Uh, it could be changes to hand-to-hand -to -hand fighting. Um, we think that the, the late uh, Roman infantrymen uh, didn't fight necessarily in the same formations or in the same style that a gladius would enable. Um, and there's a lot of differences. You know, the gladius is usually um, carried on the right side of a soldier's hip. Uh, that way they pull it out with their right hand all in one motion. The spot is actually carried on the left side. Uh, there's also some indications like different types of armor uh, that support that there may have been a change in fighting tactics favoring kind of a cut and thrust uh, style of fencing. Uh, and then probably the most likely explanation is that uh, the late Roman Empire heavily relied on auxiliary units, uh, meeting soldiers from outside the empire to do its fighting. Um, these auxiliary units would have brought their own native equipment and weapons, which the Spatha was already in widespread use by most of the major Celtic cultures. Um, we actually have a, a basic blade. Uh, this is from Scotland, actually. Uh, this Spatha is currently in the Scottish National Museum. And this already looks pretty medieval. If I put a cross guard on that and pommel, you, you probably couldn't recognize the difference between a sword of antiquity and a sword of the medieval era. And then for comparison, we have a, a Spanish falcata. Uh, these are another type of sword that the Celts would have used. Uh, these seem to have died out during the early medieval era, but uh, they're a good point of reference. This one's actually in the Met. And then these two are actually Albion reproductions uh, for size comparison. Um, the other thing to note is that there's kind of a, their own typology, and these did change over time. Some of these spathos have fullers. Um, some of them have tapers, uh, some of them have parallel edges, different points. Um, it's kind of interesting to look about it. Uh, I don't think I have any more notes. Yep. So uh, when it ends up happening, the Roman Empire, of course, dissolves, uh, breaks into East and West. Uh, the Western Empire dissolves in continental Europe. And the Eastern Empire uh, lives on as a Byzantine. So they're pretty much Romans. They consider themselves Romans and they continue to use these weapons uh, well into the medieval era. 
but we want to talk about how this sword involves into uh, how it evolves in continental Europe. So these swords end up evolving into what we think of as Viking swords, um, which is kind of a misnomer. Uh, the, the Viking weapons are really Frankish blades uh, by about the 7th, 8th, and primarily the early 9th century. The Franks are really the dominating power in continental Europe. They by the time of Charlemagne, they pretty much owned France, Germany, um, most of Italy, uh, you, you name it, uh, with the exception of southern Spain, which is under Moorish control. Uh, let's see here. So if we're looking at some of these blades, you get some of the famous blades like the Ulfberts, uh, which actually have an inscription uh, in them. Uh, we believe that this is their, the manufacturer of the blades, but these blades were produced from the 8th all the way until the 11th century. So they were probably manufactured in some sort of uh, standardized industrial uh, center. Uh, we think the Rhineland specifically uh, because the crosses indicates Christianity uh, or Eclastic. E uh, sorry, I'm going to try to read my notes. Uh, these blades are, uh, are related to the church. So during this time, the church is organizes a lot of the, the manufacture of arms and armor. Uh, these names are also Latin. Uh, the interesting thing about these blades is that they are no longer pattern welded. So up to this point, a lot of the, the Roman blades and blades of the other Celtic cultures and uh, really anything from continental Europe or folded over multiple times to create a homogeneous end product. Uh, these blades actually contain really good carbon steel uh, that they don't need to be folded. And this is one of the indicators that they're a quality blade. Uh, Ulfbert swords aren't the only blades during this time that are, are very well known. Um, there's a lot of surviving swords from this time uh, that are really high quality and I don't have a way to see chat, but I could post them later. Uh, we have uh, Niso, Bonto, um, Inglery is a, another manufacturer that we see pretty common with these swords. And this kind of sets up an interesting thing that we see in the early medieval period as well, that these swords bear a lot of religious inscriptions. Um, the most common that I've seen is in nomine domine, uh, which is Latin for in the name of the Lord. And this is something that continues well until the late medieval era. So when talking about these kind of what we think of Viking Age swords, um, it's important to look at some of their elements. The blade shapes really don't change a whole lot, um, but we have a, a lot of different hilt types. And one of the interesting things to note, uh, Sue Bruning uh, has a book called The Sword in the Early Medieval Northern Europe, and she does kind of a statistical analysis of a lot of art and sculpture, and she actually notices that a lot of these lob pommels uh, are usually depicted with kings or chieftains or a biblical features, uh, biblical figures of note. So uh, if you look at some of the early Bibles, uh, we actually see a lot of this where these swords are depicted. Usually you're head honchos carrying them and then we can see other individuals that are carrying uh, standard issue uh, round pommels. Uh, so this is a, an important note uh, for uh, societal implications. Not sure if that made sense. Uh, let me stop here for questions. Anybody have any questions? Okay, well, let me go ahead and cool. continue then. Uh, the only other thing to note is uh, this one is actually an Albion recreation. Everything else here is a, an artifact. I think this one is in Norway. Uh, this is a Frankish blade from a tomb that was recovered in France. So let's shift gears and let's talk about typologies. Uh, so starting with kind of the, the Viking weapons, uh, we get a number of typologies. Um, their earliest is Jan Peterson. Uh, he develops a typology in 1919. 
uh, that maps out all of these different hilt configurations that we see uh, in the early medieval uh, era. And what ends up happening is uh, this is pretty comprehensive. It's still referenced today in a lot of work. Uh, he determines that there's roughly about 26 pommel types and he creates this whole hierarchy of and family tree of them. Uh, what ends up happening is a lot of other researchers come along and they start using this as a baseline for their typologies. Uh, R.E.M. Wheeler comes around about 15 to 20 years later and he develops his own simplified variation of this. He develops this into seven hilt constructions. And then Edward Oakshock comes around and he also adds his own critique and he adds two more uh, hilt constructions to this typology. And this kind of launches uh, Oakshock's career, which we'll talk about. Uh, the other typology to note about Viking blades or Frankish blades uh, would be the Alfred Gibbing typology. Um, this really doesn't come about till the 90s, but this is something interesting to look about if you're, you're doing any type of research. Oh, I keep skipping slides. So the most important typology we talk about with medieval swords is Oakshot typology. Uh, Oakshot's born in about 1901. I think he dies in 1990. His career spans almost the entirety of the 20th century. Uh, and he does a lot of research and he publishes quite a, a number of books. Um, what he ends up doing instead of looking at hilt construction is he looks at blade characteristics. Particularly, he looks at proportions and shapes of blades uh, for the late medieval period. Uh, think about the 11th century and onward. Um, from our point of view, uh, it's interesting to read his early work where he starts laying this out. And then later in the 20th century, he, he writes about it and he laments that there's lots of problems with it uh, since he developed it as a young man. And then he's forced to actually create a number of different subtypes and try to kind of pigeonhole uh, swords into specific types. Uh, he even admits that there's a number that are not easily put in the typology and he, he labels them as such. Um, the interesting thing to note for us is to describe the typology uh, for foundational knowledge purposes is we have types 10 through 14. Uh, these are generally characterized by large broad cutting blades and they generally have a rounded point. And what happens is, you know, around the 13th, uh, 14th century, we start seeing a change in this type of typology where blades start becoming uh, heavily tapered and they start having really aggressive points. Uh, and we see this uh, continue onward. And really what this is an indicator of is a, a solution and a problem. Um, the sword is a solution to the problem of armor because uh, we start seeing armor uh, drastically increase in the 13th century. Uh, in the 14th century, we start seeing early variations of plate armor. And by the 15th century, we have full plate armor on the battlefield. Uh, let me stop, anybody have any questions? Oh, uh, looks like Will's got a question. Um, he says, uh, the migration era sword in my mind is a Damascus or pattern welded blade. Is there a metal metallurgical reason our objective for constructing a sword? Uh, is there a met metallurgical reason uh, or objective for constructing a sword with pattern welding? Sure. So again, we have to look at how they were producing iron. Uh, iron that was produced via early bloomeries and furnaces was pretty poor in quality. Um, the consistency of carbon content is all over the map, um, which means to get a homogenous product, blacksmiths would actually take bars of iron or what they thought was steel and they would pattern welding, meaning that they would take bars and they would twist them together in a very hot flame to physically weld them together. And by layering this, uh, you get a stronger uh, sword. Um, it's also interesting to see how like wrought iron was used in them uh, because there is some material uh, conservation as well. So a lot of times you'll have high carbon steel on the edges where it's important to have it but the middle of the sword is actually wrought iron or softer steel uh, to conserve the expensive high carbon steel edge. 
Uh, you also see that with tangs as well. Tangs tend to be welded on during this time frame. And then what ends up happening as technology increases, you get better quality furnaces. People start learning how to better produce steel from them. Uh, you get these uh, swords that are mono steel, meaning they're, they're not pattern welded. Did that make sense? And then he makes a comment here. Pattern welding equals Euro Katana, am I right? Uh, yeah, so that's definitely one way to look at it. You know, like a Japanese smith, like pulling out little pieces of tomahogany to figure out where to weld it together. It's the same idea. Um, swords that were manufactured in Europe are just as complex as anywhere else in the world. Uh, there are some myths, um, you know, like Damascus steel. Um, today we use Damascus as kind of a slang term for pattern welding, which is the technical nomenclature for producing these layers of steel. Um, there's nothing special with steel that came from Damascus. Uh, the best indication is that there's a special type of textile that comes from the city of Damascus called Damas cloth, uh, which is a really intricate uh, style of, of textile. Um, and, and this is where this slang term comes from. Now there is Wootz steel, which is crucible steel that comes from generally India. Uh, this is something entirely different uh, and, and is worth uh, talking about, but it's kind of outside the scope of this talk. Cool, I think that's, that's all the questions we have so far. Cool. I wish I knew how to use Zoom because I actually can't figure out where the chat button is to actually read the chat. <laughs> okay, so let's go on and continue. Actually, if I may, my name is John. I sent one, but I may not. I've got one quick question on the typology, if I may. Sure. Um, yeah, it's, it, did O-Shot also, and I've, I've tried to do a little bit of my own. Uh, yeah, I've also, oh, uh, uh, I've also done a little bit of my own research, but still learning. Um, did he not only allow that the, the uh, typology across time, you know, like the earlier versions, you know, like 11, 1200s, but yep. didn't it have some relationship to the development of armor during the Middle Ages? I mean, if you look at the later, uh, you know, the uh, later models, a lot of those because of the tips, you know, also, you know, how they move from the cutting to more of the thrusting type, you know, to be able to penetrate points in armor. If you could maybe just give your thought of two on that please yeah yeah no that's entirely true and that, that's actually kind of the the direction i'm going in so the big change is you have these big broad tip blades uh these things are pretty hefty uh they're great for cutting but not very good for thrusting uh, so what ends up happening, like I said, in the, the 13th, 14th century, we start seeing improvements in armor. Uh, we no longer see just chain mail or leather or anything else. Um, these are heavy reinforced tips most of the time uh, that are very good for things like half sorting if you want to puncture armor. Uh, and this is kind of what we see in the HEMA tradition of swords is we see a cut and thrust um, series of fencing systems develop. So if you think of like older swords, um, think of like the, the Spatha we talked about, you know, this doesn't have a cross guard. This isn't meant for defense. This is purely an offensive weapon. This is a single uh, uh, handed sword that would have been used in combination with a shield. And the quality of steel impacts the development of the medieval sword. So these early Sparthas that are like heavily pattern welded, or sometimes they're not pattern welded at all, they're, they're just wrought iron they break a lot. We actually have a lot of examples of these called semi spathas where they just regrind them into gladiuses. And then by the time we get to um, the, the Viking age, um, we start seeing uh, improvements in the quality of steel. Uh, and we start seeing differences in the fencing system. So you start seeing early cross guards develop. So these are really there for defense. So you can have blade on blade contact um, and then by uh, the development of the medieval blast furnace, uh, the quality of mono steel that's being produced actually allows for these uh, really narrow reinforced tips. In earlier swords, a tip like this would have easily broken off. So the technologies allowed this to actually develop. And it's developed 
primarily in response to fighting plate armor. Did that make sense? Yes, thank you. Cool. So let's go ahead and continue. So um, let's talk about problems with typologies. So when we're looking at the Oakshot typology, um, by the way, this is a, an illustration by Peter Johnson that's on the Albion's website. I haven't properly labeled that as a resource. Um, when we're looking at these swords, um, these early swords that we see in like the uh, 11th and 12th century, they're used well throughout the entirety of the late medieval period, like well into the 16th and 17th century. But we start seeing these new blades uh, actually come about. But we start also seeing problems with typology, mainly in that blades are repurposed over a long period of time. So Oakshot actually references a number of these blades. Um, one that I find really interesting is a, a lance neck cat's uh, which is a 16th century blade. Uh, he did research on it and determined that it was actually a 7th century Spartha blade um, due to the pattern welding and style of the blade. I can't find a picture of it, but this is the closest description I found that matches the sword that he, he investigated. Uh, so we have a standard cat's bulger, kind of double looped hilt and construction. And these blades are fairly round. Um, they look like Spotha blades. And in this instance, it actually looks like somebody somehow came across a historical blade and reused it. Uh, this uh, blade sits in the National Museum of Zurich, by the way. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, literary uh, stories. A lot of the Norse sagas contain several stories of grave robbing, essentially, where people would break into a burial mound, grab a sword, and use that sword, and then pass it down like two or three generations in their family. So some of these swords exist through the early and late medieval uh, period for several hundred years. Uh, and, and this is something that a lot of people actually support. Um, if you look at like the Norse sagas, for instance, you see kennings, which are literary devices. Um, a lot of the, the analogies that are made for swords uh, usually uh, involve like ancient heirloom or time-proofed or battle-proven, uh, meaning that individuals during the medieval era valued uh, blades that were tested and proven and old. Another problem with typology is they don't indicate a specific region where the blade is created. Uh, we have a lot of forgeries, for example. So we talked about the Ulfport blades. Uh, these blades, there's a number of these blades that are actually misspelled or have variations in spelling indicating that somebody else copied the blade and tried to sell it off as such. And we can actually see why. So if we look at blade pricing. Um, this is a little past the late medieval period that we like to think of in HEMA or in, in research. Um, but we can actually see price differences. So this is a pricing guide from Seville and uh, the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, we see blades from Toledo going for 24 reels, which is a, a Spanish silver piece. Uh, this is an ordinance from the city itself. Uh, putting a price uh, ceiling on the cost of weapons. Uh, we see blades that are made in Seville, which is the city this ordinance is published at, go for 22 reels. And then we see blades that are imported from other countries. So uh, in Germany specifically, you know, they're half the price. Uh, in Italy, Genoa, uh, we see them go for eight reels in Seville. And uh, in, from French blades, uh, the same thing, they're a third of the price roughly. So what ends up happening is, you know, a blacksmith in Germany looks at this and he says, well, I can make a blade that looks like it's from Toledo using different maker marks and different construction. And a lot of times these blades are of the same quality and they get passed off as a blade made in Toledo. Does that, did I articulate that correctly for everybody to understand? Sounds good to me. Yeah. Yeah. So the point with this is that there's a, a lot of crafts people involved in the production of arms and armor. Um, kind of the, the notion that you have an individual lone blacksmith create you a sword is largely fictitious. 
you know, it may have happened if you were out in the middle of nowhere, but if you had that sword constructed, it was probably not very good. So what you have is you have a division of labor in a lot of the major cities. Um, we see the formation of guilds to support this division of labor. And what this does is it means that the art quality of arms and armor produced is efficient, um, it is affordable, um, and you can heavily customize it via like the latest fashions of the day. So uh, if you were say uh, an established individual uh, looking for a blade in medieval Europe, uh, you would have probably went to a cutler. Um, a cutler is somebody who would have contracted out work for your armor arms and armor. Uh, in this case, we'll use the example of a sword. He would have been somebody who would have built the hilt of the sword, meaning the, the handle, potentially the pommel and the cross guard, but he would have contracted that work out to a bladesmith to make the actual smith blade it smell, to make the actual blade itself. Uh, he would have contracted out work to grinders and polishers to get that blade up to snuff. Uh, he would have contracted out work uh, for sheaths as, as well for those blades, uh, which requires additional wood and leather working. Um, so let's provide an example of why like the typologies are a concern. Uh, say I'm a German knight in the 14th century and I'm traveling from Austria uh, to fight in a tournament in Italy and I stop in Innsbruck uh, to buy a new arming sword, for instance. Well, I talk to a cutler there. Uh, that cutler is, well, this is Innsbruck. We manufacture armor. We're really not well known for swords. Uh, he has blades that he's imported from Passau, which is down the river. Uh, he makes my blade in Innsbruck, but the blade is from Passau. I get a sword out of the deal. I go to Italy. I lose the tournament. I lose that sword to an Italian knight. That Italian knight may go to Milan, for instance, and rehilt that sword, um, depending on the fashion of the day. A few years later, I go broke as an Italian knight trying to keep up with the fashion. I sell that sword off to a trader. And, you know, the next thing you know, that Venetian trader sells that sword to a some up and coming noblemen in England. Uh, so we have a sword that has a blade manufactured in Passau, a cross guard that's manufactured in Innsbruck and assembled in Innsbruck, a pommel that's refitted in Milan that's resting in an English Protestant church like 150 years later after its construction. So this type of sword like defies categorization. Uh, and it's one of the primary things we see happening with a lot of these uh, typology issues. So looking at the Oakshock typology, let's focus on a specific subtype just as a case study uh, because we don't have a lot of time for this talk. Um, if we're talking about HEMA nowadays, uh, the primary foundation of the fight books and treatises that we study are from the 15th and 16th century. And longsword is probably the most popular uh, of these fencing systems. If we have to describe the type of longsword fencing we do today, um, you could probably describe it best as a cut and thrust a series of techniques. Uh, so if we're looking at uh, archaeological swords, you know, what are the swords of this time period that support the type of fencing that we do? Um, type 18 is probably the one that best fits the, this kind of ideal model, uh, though that we are interested in all types of swords. Um, Oakshot actually mentions that these are the most common types of swords between the 15th and early 16th century. Um, they have a standard taper that runs to a very sharp point, but this taper has a curve here. Uh, to support uh, a nice uh, diamond shaped cross section for cutting. Uh, and what we can do is we can look at artwork as well to try to confirm some of this hypothesis. Uh, we can look at things like Albert Durer's work. Um, he has a lot of knights that he depicts in realistic armor and arms. Uh, and we can actually see that some of these swords match a lot of what we're seeing in the typology. So type 18, uh, we have a long, narrow taper blade to a very sharp point. If we blow it up, we can see things like a deep pommel, uh, a narrow handle, a riser, 
a rain guard, uh, a stylistic cross guard, which is actually curved. And we have a date, so this is from 1513. So do we have swords that support this type of artwork? Well, yeah, we do. Um, if we're looking at that, this exact similar sword actually exists in a museum in Munich. Um, this is a, a really well-known uh, German example of a Type 18 sword. And then, of course, you know, this is continental Europe, so there's variations. Um, we have arming swords, we have bastard swords, we have long swords, and we have different styles. So it, generally, the, these narrow long swords we generally associate with uh, the German-speaking lands. Um, some of the wider blades we associate with Italy. Um, we get some interesting long swords that have like single handed handles. Um, these come out of Spain and we'll get variations such as some of the Danish long swords, which actually have a really long handle and this kind of interesting ricasso. Uh, questions, comments, or concerns? It uh, looks like we have two questions. Sure. Um, let's see. Uh, the first one was, um, would the interchangeability or the constant reuse of blades uh, affect the ability of, of dating a blade? Yes. So that's uh, an issue with the typology. So we see blades show up a lot in the archaeological record, like this cat's bogger that I mentioned. This was a 16th century sword used by a lance neck. And the blade itself is repurposed from a 7th century Spatha blade. Okay. And then the second question. Um, oh, I guess um, another point here or question was, uh, is carbon dating ever used to determine uh, the date of blades or swords or components of swords? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I know that there are a lot of... Uh, analysis of metallurgy using things like x-rays to try to determine how they're constructed. Mm -hmm. But dating is fairly difficult on a lot of these blades. I don't know if you can do any type of carbon dating. Cool. Uh, and then the last question is, um, since pieces of blades were made in different places, how interchangeable were parts, if at all? Uh, parts would have been customized to the individual blade. You know, for instance, there, there's slight variations uh, in the tang of the blade. Um, so the cross guard, hilt, and pommel would have had to been created specifically for that blade. Same thing with sheaths. That's why we see a lot of these guilds uh, form. So uh, a book I'm reading currently it talks about a lot of the guilds in London. Um, one of the more prominent guilds is actually the Cutler's Guild. And they contract that work out to a bladesmith guild to make the blades they form the hilt and handle, and then they further contract work out to a separate guild that does sheaths specifically. Cool. Oh, uh, one more. Um, it seems that the type 18 with uh, modern HEMA practitioners are a favorite for cutting. Are there other types that are good for cutting? Um, well, this gets into like an issue of like I want a cheater sword and like as we study HEMA as practitioners we should really look at all swords um, but if you you really want to look at specific swords that are meant for cutting you really want to look at these early medieval swords of the type 10 through the type 14. Uh, not to say like the type 18 is cut really well uh, some of it also depends on like edge geometry, like uh, the Alexandria right now from Albion it has been really popular the last few years because it has such a wide blade, but that in itself is actually a type 18 blade. All right, that's all the questions. Sure. Uh, so let's go ahead and continue. So let's talk a little bit about sword design. Uh, and to talk about sword design, let's talk about geometry and its use in medieval uh, life. So if we look at early depictions of God creating earth in a lot of early Bibles, uh, like the Moralese or St. Augustine, uh, we see him not holding a hammer or a saw or a chisel. He's actually holding a compass where, when he creates the world. 
And, and the compass is really an instrument of geometry. And it really underscores the importance of geometry in the medieval world. Um, geometry was a means of understanding how the world was created, how it functions, how it operates. Um, it's a, a means of uh, creating order in what seems like a, a chaotic world. And we, we have a lot of evidence to support that. So if we look at the original liberal arts that would have been the primary foundation of education in the medieval world, uh, we can actually see uh, geometry as one of the, the seven bases. Um, there's a trivium, which are the three most important. Uh, that's grammar, rhetoric, and language, which is dialect. And then secondary schooling would have been uh, things like music, arithmetic, geometry, and uh, astronomy. We also know that uh, this type of education system existed for a very long period of time. This was handed down by the Romans. Uh, we actually have Roman historians like Martinius Capella. Uh, he's a, a famous Roman teacher and scholar that lives in North Africa during the fifth century. Uh, he actually originally writes down these seven liberal arts. And this is actually what a lot of people in medieval Europe uh, reference as learning material. Um, this depiction of him is actually from a 12th century tapestry in France. So geometry is important, but how, how important, how often is it actually used? Well, if we look at a lot of the craftspeople of the day, uh, geometry was a primary design principle. Uh, if we're looking at like the medieval Gothic cathedrals that were created, uh, we see a lot of geometry used. Um, there's an interesting book, if you like architecture, uh, called uh, the Geometry of Creation uh, by Robert Bork. He actually went and found a lot of these original drafts of uh, Gothic cathedrals, and he actually does like an extensive analysis of pinpricks denoting where compasses are used, um, where rollers are used to draw lines, and he comes up with a, a kind of a system of a lot of the geometric shapes that were popular during the time. So from this, we, we know geometry is important. We know that craftspeople used it. Um, how widely did craftspeople use it? We don't know, but I think it's safe to assume that it was pretty popular as a design principle, and it's something that blade smiths probably utilized heavily, or at least cutlers did. Uh, and that leads me to the next slide, which is um, Peter Johnson's work. Uh, so Peter Johnson's a, a well-known swordsmith. Uh, he's been making swords for 10 plus years, and he's famous for kind of developing uh, this geometric principle of design for, for modern recreation swords. Um, what he's done is he's looked at a lot of historic examples, and he's looked at proportions, and he's found some of the popular proportions that we see in swords, and he breaks down some of the geometric regressions. Um, so we have swords that fit a couple of popular categories, such as a, a one to six ratio, uh, we see 3 to 11. Uh, we see 1 to 4 as another common ratio that we see for these blades. And there's even more geometry involved with actually developing uh, the actual hilt. Uh, so I'll play some Albion propaganda for you. So these circles in design are used during the medieval era. Uh, they're called vesicas. Uh, they're just overlapping circles. And what we see is that to break down the proportions of the blade based off of this.
So the Alexandria and the, the Albion line of collection is obviously not a, a historical blade, but he uses similar design principles that he's seen on historical blades. And we see a, a strong amount of evidence pointing to the fact that some sort of system of design was used, uh, whether it's this one or some other one, we don't know, and we probably never will know. Um, but from modern design, I can tell you that these make really good swords. Um, A lot of his work is actually uh, written down. Uh, there's a book called The Sword Form and Thought, which was part of a museum exhibit about four or five years ago. Um, that book is really good and I'll talk a little bit more about it. So when we're talking about sword design, there's a couple of points of interest uh, that I would like to bring up. For us, we generally think of like sword blade balance as like a primary point of interest. Uh, if you've been cutting tatami or clay in KDF, we've probably talked about the point of percussion, which is kind of a sweet spot for cutting things. Um, but there's a more scientific approach to how we look at these points of interest. So let me start with the vibration nodes. So uh, sometimes called a harmonic node or a point of percussion. Um, your, your sword acts as a, the medieval sword acts as a, a large tuning fork. So when you import force on it, it vibrates back and forth. And what ends up happening is you have a point in the hilt where it doesn't vibrate. Uh, this is great for your dominant hand because it means that energy is not imparted in your hand when you have uh, significant impacts fencing. More importantly, you have a vibration node in the bottom third of the blade um, where it does not flex, uh, meaning this is a sweet spot for cutting stuff. So if you wanted to cut off somebody's arm or leg, this would be where you would do it. Uh, obviously though, in, when fencing, we tend to use the whole lower third of the blade to cut. And for most of the time, I mean, this is very efficient. You don't really have to worry about it. Uh, the interesting thing about this vibration node is it seems to be a function of length. So if you look at all the historic examples of swords, um, this vibration node really doesn't change at all. It's usually 70% of the blade length plus or minus 3%. So it's a, a very easy to measure uh, variable. Uh, the other point of interest, which we generally don't think a whole lot about when we're fencing are the pivot points. So if I take a long sword and I hold it with one hand at the, the cross guard and I shake it back and forth, the blade actually pivots around a forward action point down here. And when I take it with one hand by the pommel and I shake it back and forth, the sword blade will actually pivot around uh, an action point further up the blade. And this is actually uh, something that I wanna talk about as an applied means of geometry and fencing. So uh, this would be best done in a classroom environment where people could actively fence, but it's good to talk about uh, as a theory hammer exercise. So what I would recommend, especially if you're at home, you can play around with these, these points of interest, get some colored tape and actually find them on your fetter or your sword at home. Um, find your vibration node, find your forward and uh, action points find your aft action points, and play around fencing with them. I suspect that there's a couple binds and windings where thinking about these points are really, really helpful. So in traditional kind of classroom fashion, we tend to think of binds in terms of weak binds and strong binds, um, but there's more to it than that. Uh, like when I was a beginner, I would notice that certain techniques don't work very well with certain types of binds. So for instance, in some of the like the early CKDF classes I took, uh, we taught things like striking as a, a common uh, type of cut and technique for taking center. So a striking, if I'm in Alber, I throw a short edge cut at my opponent. Uh, we teach this as a means to displace somebody in short point by taking the center line. And when you make blade contact, if you made it with the weak of your blade, you may have noticed that it didn't do much to take the center line away from your opponent. 
Uh, it may not have even moved the sword very much. You know, as a beginner, I found if I made contact with the lower action points or the strong set of blades, I'd end up just being stabbed in the face by my opponent. But there's a sweet spot here around the vibration node where I'm doing techniques like striking, where all of the energy that is uh, transferred into my opponent's blade is maximized. And this is kind of a Goldilocks bind that I see occur quite often. And it's something we really don't think about or train in HEMA. And I think it's something we should probably take a look at. Uh, the other uh, interesting note, um, when we're binding on an opponent's blade, we tend to talk about windings. So what's the most efficient way for me to get around an opponent's blade and stab them in the face as we, we do a bind? Um, if I bind on an opponent's blade on my weak, say I'm around that forward action point, is it more efficient for me to use my left hand to power that winding? Or is it more efficient for me to use my right hand to power that winding because I'm at that forward action point. That way I can easily get around my opponent's blade. You know, vice versa, if I'm at a strong bind and I wanna do that winding, is it more efficient for me to use my right hand where the, the pivot point's out here or is it more efficient for me to use the left hand which is down here at uh, the aft pivot point? Uh, so there's a, a conservation of energy and efficiency uh, idea here that I would like to play around with in fencing. Unfortunately, we're, we're in lockdown and this isn't something we can actively play with. So it's something I would encourage you to think about and maybe next time you're fencing, uh, give this a try. Um, hey, Jonathan, if I may, this is John again. This is, a, I find this slide a bit fascinating. Is there any way that you could, would you mind sharing that particular slide? Yeah, sure. Uh, so this, this should be recorded, but I'll go ahead and uh, as a matter of fact, if you want to screen copy it right now, and I'll post yeah. it to the Facebook page as well. All right, thank you. So, you know, what I want to focus on here is just to get you thinking about other ways to think about fencing and how to incorporate sword design as well as geometry into your fencing. Uh, so I think this is the most important slide I have here in the deck. Any other questions, comments, or concerns? Did what I say make sense? Because we're talking about techniques that we don't always necessarily do in person. No, I mean, it makes sense to me a, a strike and as, a, as an upward cut, right? And thinking about acting on the blade as if it was a, just your ordinary cut, wanting to hit it with that vibrational node. Yeah. And I think this would be like a good control for other techniques as well is trying to aim for vibration node on vibration node binds. Right. I think that we have a tendency to misjudge distance and to have poor targeting and accuracy. So I think that's a good exercise in of itself. But I think if we start trying a lot of like the Hapstuks, uh, you know, if I look at trying to do like Abstetsons and so forth, that if I'm focusing on these types of binds, yeah. it's gonna provide a really good foundation to launch these secondary and uh, techniques that we see down the line in the kind of decision tree making process. Yeah, sounds good. Um, yeah, it, it, I, I have been trying to distill some ideas on, on handling and transitions from ha to half uh, and out of half or transitions to close um, ring and M Schwert stuff. Uh, thinking about the center of balance and rotations around that. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you're half sorting too, I mean, you probably want to be grabbing it at this vibration node. Yeah. Um, but I, I guess I, I hadn't fully thought it out. Um, but I guess one piece that's that's related, I think, to this this broader theory is um, that the sword rotates around its center of balance and that. You know your actions need to be need uh, are more efficient if you acknowledge that rather than trying to rotate through your hand or through your wrist. Yeah, so, yeah, and that's yeah. something I found hard to articulate. Mm -hmm. So you know, I come from like a Japanese martial arts background where like yeah. we power all our cuts with the left hand, left wrist. Yep. Mm -hmm. But in HEMA, we we do it with both, and the sword is a giant lever. 
how we use that lever and how efficiently we use it, I think has a large impact in our fencing. Yeah. So that's cool. Uh, let me talk about some of the resources I use. I have a lot of books here. Um, I don't really necessarily recommend buying any of them. Uh, the only one I would recommend picking up that talks about geometry and these points of interest is the sword form and thought book. This was a museum book uh, by the Klingen Museum in Solingen, Germany. Uh, this book details a lot of Peter Johnson's thoughts. He actually did a lot of the, the design in the book itself. Uh, and this is a great book to have from a sword catalog perspective as well. Because uh, he talks about a lot of uh, historical swords and how they fit into this geometric system. Uh, a lot of people were really sad when this went out of print the first time. It's come back for a second print. I suggest you pick it up before it gets out of print again. Um, Old standbys, oak shots, always great. Records of the medieval long uh, medieval sword is probably his most famous. Um, I really like swords in the Viking age. Uh, if you like architecture, again, the Geometry of Creation by Robert Burke is a fantastic book. It's very academic. Uh, and then I have a number of resources which I'll also post, which are free. You can go online and check them out. Any further questions, comments, concerns? Yeah, if you've got questions, just uh, unmute and ask. No, no questions. Oh, I've got a question. Sure. Um, so uh, we have the Oakshot typology of uh, um, oh wait, I'm not sure, actually sure if it's Oakshot who came up with this. Um, the the uh, pommels and hilt configurations. Um, sure, so let's go back. So like in the Oakshot typology, we have pommels and hilt configurations. Yeah. Uh, these aren't something he strongly emphasizes, but he does catalog these in his oh, system. See. Okay. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, for instance, we see a lot of like type eight cross guards. He'll, he'll say like, oh yeah, I yeah. find these on a lot of Italian swords. Type right, 12 right. is like a characteristic of the Holy super Roman German. Empire. Yeah. yeah, super German. And we see like all sorts of crazy pommels. Like there'll be like one sword that has a crescent pommel yeah, and he'll put it in the typology um the majority of these are usually disc-shaped pommels but you see pair of pommels as well um i'm trying to remember the one i think it's the t2 is the fish pommel uh which was like very fashionable for like two or three decades in italy oh um, right right yeah right. so so some of yeah. these are really great in trying to date some of these swords but again a lot of it's also speculation yeah, I guess the, the question I had is is related to uh, a lot of the wacky pommels and hilts that you see in, uh, for example, Fiore, but I'm, I'm sure there are actually a few German sources that um, the hilts and the pommels appear to be configured for uh, Morchlog. Yeah. They seem to be optimized for them. Yeah, so that's an interesting thing. Um, something I've come across a lot is when you're reading a lot of the oak shot material is... Um, we talked about the type 18 swords and how they were really popular during the 15th and 16th century. Mm -hmm. He goes into more detail. It wasn't just the long sword specifically. The most popular variation of this was actually the hand and a half or bastard swords. Um, because these are usually used uh, as a means of self-defense or displaying um, public ceremonies. Uh, so this is something that's easy to carry around in a lot of the free cities. And when you're reading about like Fury or a lot of these other techniques, you see techniques that involve grabbing the pommel. And I don't think we realize that a large variety of the long swords used were actually handed a half long swords and not full mm -hmm. long swords that we, we think of today in HEMA. Right. Well, that's interesting. I'll find, I'll find you a, an image or two of the, of the swords I'm thinking about. And also, I guess my question is like how it fits in relation to the Oakshot typology. Um, so like some swords I've seen have um, uh, uh, almost a handle where you would grab it in half sword. Uh, basically the edge has been reformed into a small handle uh, part, like about halfway down the sword. 
Oh, you're talking about the blade itself. So like down here, you would yeah, see. Exactly. Right, yeah, exactly. Right so where it's, your it's not, would be in half yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's yeah. not really sharp. It kind of yeah. has a thick ricasso or cross section. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Just like the Danish yeah. example. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it really depends on the purpose. So, I mean, those are obviously swords created specifically for war. Yeah. So, you know, as like, if you were a German knight, you'd probably own a half dozen swords, you know, maybe you have an arming sword, maybe you have a sword for tournament play, yeah. uh, you have your war sword that you carry with you into campaign. And then, you know, when you're in public settings, maybe you have a hand and a half sword that you carry around to show that you're fashionable and can, can keep up with the times. Yeah. Hey, um, this is Alex. Hey guys. Um, two things. First, we have a question in Zoom in the group chat from Ver Lingen. And after that, I have a bit of a observation with something a bit more modern. So the question was from Josh. He asks, um, what would be the effects of having your vibration point not hitting on the opponent's vibration point? Um, so, I mean, the, the most common way to think about bindings is in terms of strong and weak binds. These are the most practical way for you to do generalized fencing. Um, there are techniques where you'll want to produce uh, either or. Um, not binding on the vibration node, I don't think is a big deal in a lot of these techniques. Uh, there's only a few situations where I think it would be extremely beneficial. Um, if you're thinking about binding on the weak of the sword, you know, this will deflect a lot of incoming force, uh, but it also creates a significant impact on the sword as a kind of tuning fork. Um, so it's, it's not in your favor to do so. Not, not sure if that helps. Josh got that. Oh, hey, I found the chat. Here we go. What did you have, Alex? You said you had an observation. Um, it's just more of like a kind of a forward evolution, like um, going back to the um, Oakshot uh, typology, like with all the various like uh, different um, um, variations. <laughs> for like a better way to describe it, of like each like sword. I see that like a interesting parallel as like um, with like um, weaponry, like for, I wouldn't say like more civil use, like uh, like starting with like um, a primitive like uh, gunpowder weapons all the way up to modern um, uh, firearms that it seems like even though like everything here has like pretty much a baseline like what usage of either status or I am using it as a sidearm the different like manufacturers or like blacksmiths putting in their little uh, different design or for whatever use like in their um, area would say parallels to what we have or like even with like today's weaponry like I can have like two, like another friend and I, we could have two like completely like baseline, like s similar, uh, like the exact same rifle, but we would put on different things for whatever usage we need um, for like uh, whatever purpose that we find that is more important to us. So I'm seeing like such as like a, the more was it the like the the one pommel you said that was more for its like towards half sorting maybe that knight uh, was more like focused into using that in that such fa fashion whereas another knight would feel like um, that's not something he would want to do or he is uh, has a strength elsewhere so. That's just like something I, um, I kind of noted. Yeah, yeah. So that's a good observation. So, I mean, swords really aren't designed to be modular, like, you know, a modern firearm with like a rail that you could change the scope on, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, they did refit them and reuse them depending on the preferences of the user though. Mm -hmm. um, and, and like I said, you know, if you were somebody of means, you probably own multiple weapons. So you'd get all those variations for the different use cases you had in mind. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you wanted to strut around with your uh, heater shield, you'd have, you know, uh, an arming sword. If you were on horseback, maybe you have a hand and a half or a full long sword for uh, campaign. You know, mm -hmm. there's all sorts of variations. Mm -hmm. All right, cool, cool. And then Will asks, to what extent did metallurgical technology drive sword design? For example, were the 16th century great sword or complex hilt rapier feasible pr propositions with earlier centuries metalworking know-how, or were these designs driven more by use or fashion than metallurgical technology? Um, bit of both. So like long swords have existed well into antiquity so like we have celtic examples of swords that are like 42 inches long uh they're beasts you know they require two hands to swing how they were used we're not sure you know was the quality of steel used to create them very good not really um so you know a lot of it's more a arms race between arms and armor uh but the technology aspect of it really enabled some of the creation of these later swords as far as improvement. So like a rapier blade, for instance, has a, a very small cross section. If I were to make that with poor quality steel, that, that cross section would snap very easily. Um, does that answer your question? Looks like it did. Yep. Yep. He says, nice. Thanks. Cool. It's kind of interesting. So they start with this, the very fat blade with the almost rounded point. And then we see, I guess, with the introduction of chainmail, like you were saying, uh, it goes to a more tapered blade with the point and then um, it widens back out. Like with the, the 22 at the very end here, it widens back out to a combination cutter thruster almost. Yeah, so uh, things to like think about. So when you're researching armor chainmail has existed since Roman times. Um, if you're looking at like specific blades, um, a lot of the Viking Age swords, you know, you can't fence with them in the style of Hemo that we have today. Uh, you'll break your wrist. You can't do the wrist actions and the wrist snaps that we have in HEMA. So these are meant for like very large, broad cuts. And the shade, shape of the, the blade actually supports this. You know, these are broad, heavy blades for cutting. And a lot of these you can't see in this diagram, but if you, if you pick up uh, swords in the Viking Age, uh, they actually denote the balance point of a lot of these blades. And they're like way out here, as opposed to the later swords, which are more closer to the actual cross guard um, and then when you're looking at uh, the oak shot typology um, some of these swords get crazy once you get to like 19 or 20 you get swords that have like three or four fullers some of them are like really decorative uh, these are like largely creations of like the late 16th and 17th century and you just see a, a lot of different stuff um, especially some of these like the um, type 21s you know these are like throwback um italian blades to like the roman period so they look very roman imperial if you see them in person and then you know some of these wide blades I, i'm not too sure you know if they served a specific purpose or not um they're just all over the board and like i said oakshot kind of laments some of this later on in his career because he's trying to hand jam swords into categorization and these are swords that really shouldn't be categorized. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a, the retro revival that we see in, in fashion today. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you can definitely see like some variation. So like, you know, uh, if you look at type 14, you still have a cutting blade Mm -hmm. that has a very sharp point for piercing armor and then you have a type 15 which is just very straight 
Same thing with the Type 16. These are really straight. You can't really cut very well with these swords. And I think they figure that out and be like, hey, these are really good for thrusting, but they're not really good for cutting. And then you see them uh, actually uh, iterate on these tapers and build them a little bit out more. Hi, Tim. Um, this is Will. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding the oak shock typology. The um, it it seems like I, I'm not super familiar with it, but it seemed to me that Oakshot kind of took took the physical characteristics, like the the superficial sort of shapes of the sword, to inform his typology. Um, and, and you pushed back on that if if that's incorrect. But 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 my question is this: What do you think about um, like if if you could create a more coherent typology, would you like how would you go about that? especially from the perspective of a, of a martial arts practitioner, like a swords arts practitioner, uh, with, the, with the characteristics, the physical handling of a sword and form such a typology? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, and as an amateur, I'm not really qualified to answer it. Um, looking at the typology though, Oakshot generally f categorizes blades based off of their shape and proportion. Um, so the book I would recommend is, um, the sword, uh, records of the medieval sword would probably be his best book because it's been republished like three times and he has like a ton of appendices in it. Um, as far as there are other typology systems that people have tried to create, I personally don't like topologies. Um, humans have like a necessity to, to categorize stuff. And I think that's kind of foolish. Um, I think there's some general ideas such as the evolution between cutting swords and thrusting th swords and cut and thrust variations that are interesting and should be uh, talked about. But ultimately, I think the typology just provides a very basic framework to have these conversations. I don't think there's any other uh, value that they provide. Okay, cool, thanks. Yeah, I'm thinking like specifically the, I, I can't remember exactly who it is, but there was a book, it may have been, I think it actually was the sword form and thought where they give the sort of the dynamic uh, properties, like diagram of each sword that they, that they, that they describe. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. So you, you're talking about like the wavelength type stuff that was yeah. in the background. Yeah, so uh -huh. that's a uh, like really interesting. That's a type of like mass distribution. Um, that's a good indicator for trying to figure out the distal taper of a blade. So uh, these medieval blades weren't the same thickness all the way through the entire length of the blade. You know, at the hilt, you would have had a very thick uh, cross section, and then it quickly tapers down into a uh, smaller thickness. You have a gradual thickness reduction towards the point, and then it completely tapers off to a point. Don't know if that made sense. Oh yeah, definitely. So actually, I think I have, uh, let's see here. So here's, let me share my screen again. So here's actually the, the long sword I made. And if you're looking at the distal taper of a, a standard medieval long sword, you know, you get something that's five or six millimeters thick by the, the actual cross guard. And you see that quickly drop to a thickness of around like three to four millimeters. You see the overall length of the blade, just a gradual taper of that thickness. And then at the point, you see it quickly drop off. And this is one of the, the contributing factors of why you have a nice parabolic curve when you press your sword against a surface. Because this area of the blade is thinner than this area. So this is stiffer this is more flexible. Gotcha, thank you. Cool. So uh, Kelly asks, um, did Oakshout require multiple examples of a sword before saying it's a type? Uh, yes. Um, there's like a, some of them, you know, there may be only like three or four swords that he uses to categorize them. Um, but like type 18, you know, there's a couple dozen swords uh, that he tries to uh, group. 
And then he'll have like case studies, you know, maybe six of these swords he sees as really good examples of the subtype. And again, like I'm not an expert by any means. Like I suggest reading his stuff. It's really interesting. Oakshot's really cool because he's an English gentleman in his writing. Uh, so you get this very 19th century viewpoint of the world and how these swords operate and all these uh, tangential stories he has of going and doing all of his research and looking at historical examples and, uh, you know, all the churches he visits and tombs he looks at and artwork that's associated with them as well. So I have got a question, or at least I'm trying to think about how to articulate kind of the skepticism of typologies. Um, is it fair to say then that typologies are just a useful way to refer to swords, but don't have a deeper uh, underlying meaning in the same way that we might refer to modern firearm variants. So like if I have a 1911 A1, it means very specific things about where it came from, its physical dimensions, you know, its general operating abilities. And um, whereas with the typology, it does not go that deep. It's just saying this shape. That's, That's a good question. Um, I see both occurring in like some of Oakshot's material. Mm -hmm. um, so like some of the typologies, you know, maybe the type 18B that we talked about is usually characterized by coming from the Holy Roman Empire as being a common blade shape, but maybe in Italy, they take the same blade shape and they make it a little bit thinner. Yeah. And, and you get a very similar blade that's a little bit different. So I think I would make the modern analogy of that Kalashnikov 74, you know, that was manufactured in Soviet Russia. Well, there was also American manufacturers that copied it and improved it. So you have mm -hmm. slight variations in Kalashnikov 74s roaming about. I see. So there, there isn't that, it, it still means something, but it's not, it doesn't have that same precision that modern, modern make does. Right? Yeah. It's hit or miss. Okay. Like, like uh, one of the pommels, like I said, was like very specific to helping them date fashions and swords of a particular time. But, you know, how many swords actually have this type of pommel, you know, or this type of pommel, there's only a, a very small subset and there's not a whole lot to, to get as far as a sample size uh, analysis. Cool. Uh, Kelly asks a question. Uh, I wonder if anyone's taken the measurements from a large set of historical swords and done something like PCA analysis. I assume that's <laughs> principal components analysis to see if groups form, uh, uh, see if groups form that are at all similar to typologies like oak, shot, oak shots. Oh, that's that's a cool idea. Yeah. So you want to do like full measurement analysis. Um, so I mean, like oak shot is like the de facto source of a lot of that information. Um, you'll be surprised that there aren't really a lot of people out there cataloging swords. You think it would be common. It's not. Um, Peter Johnson's done a pretty good job in that book I mentioned, The Sword, Form, and Thought, to, to try to start doing some of that. Um, there's other efforts, too, like uh, Oakshot has, the Oakshot Institute is actually doing like 3D um, scans of historical swords to try to reproduce them and catalog them. Um, there's also a couple people in Europe that are looking at similar ways of cataloging these swords. That way they can share all the measurements of the swords themselves. Um, there's also like not a standardized means of uh, getting some of this information. So like we, I tried to talk a little bit about like points of interest, like how do you measure scientifically the vibration node of a blade other than picking it up in your hand and smacking the cross guard with your palm of your hand. Um, you know, no museum is going to allow you to come in and start smacking historically uh, preserved blades. Uh, so it's a very rudimentary system of gathering analytics. Cool. She says, thanks. If I may. Um, this is John again. Anyway, um, I'd noticed uh, 
I've noticed it kind of like handling sword when you take, you know, the, obviously the uh, furniture off, especially, you know, the hilt and the pommel, how much it changes the balance point. From your perspective, just uh, playing with the uh, blade a little bit, uh, how do you t uh, compensate for that when you're, you know, trying to look, at, from your perspective anyway, uh, making the blade as versus to having the right balance point once you put on the furniture? Yeah, so that's a good question. So um, the, the diagram I have here is actually uh, one of a bare blade without any hilt and one with a hilt. Um, we can actually see how the points differ. So the point of balance when you put on a nice pommel to uh, counterweight the blade moves that balance point towards the hilt. Um, Likewise, uh, we, if we look at the action points, the forward action point is somewhere near the vibration point on a bare blade. But once I put that pommel in, that action point gets kicked out towards the tip of the blade. Um, and if you're looking at like historical blades, you know, th these action points for long swords are generally somewhere between the point of the blade and like about here. Uh, you don't see them really back here. And what you can do is you can, A, you can grind the blade to try to match some of these. And then B, uh, the pommel weight is the most important thing that you calculate. And that's how you uh, try to balance these points of interest. So uh, just for shits and giggles, I was working on a, another presentation for my makerspace on how I made the sword that I made. And the way we did this in the class I took, which was actually with Peter Johnson, is we took um, the sword blade, we forged out a cross guard. Cross guards actually don't do a lot to change the balance of some of these points of interest. It's really all this pommel. And what we did is we played around with big balls of plasticine and clay to try to balance out the blades by hand. And then what you do is you do some math using the specific weight of that ball of plasticine and steel. And you get a small amount of clay that matches the specific weight of steel. And then you're able to mold that into a rough shaped pommel. Then you can forge out and shape that pommel. Um, and then you can, you know, you can make generalizations like most swords, like a good long sword like this is probably between like 900 and 1200 grams in weight. So you can constantly play around with grinding it, shaping it to match some of these overall weight statistics, and then to actually play around with some of these points of interest. And that's kind of how you, you start to fine tune it. And it, it just is a trial and error type of process. Did that help? Yes, thank you. Cool. Any other questions? If I may, just John, just one other comment to the group. Um, I, I'm not. Uh, I haven't really worked that much with yet. I know Joe and Henry back from working with them at the VAF for a while, and so eventually I hope to be able to uh, uh, meet some of you. But uh, I was just wanting to throw out because uh, I know a lot of things that you're looking at. I'm not sure if you're familiar in the area. There's, if anyone's curious though, uh, there's a, uh, a, an antique weapons dealer that lives in all, all places in Middleburg, Virginia called David Condon Incorporated. They actually, um, I was out there probably about three or four months ago before all the craziness started, but uh, they actually have a shop out there uh, that you can actually, they'll actually let you handle, uh, they do uh, guns and things like that, but they also have a lot of uh, antique weapons that you can I mean knives swords and some knives you can handle so if you ever I know they had a uh, type 20 and a type 22 from the 16th century that's cool you said this is Middleburg yeah it's in Middleburg Virginia and it's called David Condon in Corpus a small shop you could even say they're open now but you know yeah I think either uh and they actually not many people you know they don't have a lot of people at the time so you know as long as you maintain distance I think I don't think they'd have an issue you being in there but yeah, yeah it's called and incorporated and uh but they're out in middleburg virginia it's a little shop right off main street and they've got a lot of stuff there on two floors yeah that's cool um i've tried to look for stuff like that and it's really hard here in the u.s because you know obviously we don't have a lot of medieval european blades floating around um generally speaking we find 
stuff from American history. So you'll find a lot of like cavalry sabers uh, yeah. throughout like the 18th and 19th century. Uh, so that's, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, the the other thing I, I have issues with, like I would never buy an antique sword because uh, forgeries are so fraudulent and common. Uh, and it's really hard to, to make a, a proper purchase. Exactly. And now these, they're pretty reputable because they sell worldwide. Having said that, they're also very proud of their stuff, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so yeah. you'll, you'll yeah. pay time. And, and from my point, like I like making stuff, so I'm more interested in just making my own historical reproductions than, right. than trying they to actually, find them. They come up with occasionally, well, they actually have some really, uh, some nice pieces that, you know, like I said, any guy, a lot of them are sabers and things, but they have some unique things, but it's uh, very good antiques, uh, high quality, you know, but just if nothing else, just to have the experience and they'll let you handle it, you know, if you're interested. Yeah, that's cool. Um, one thing I will note too, like, uh, somebody had brought up the question of like cataloging swords. Uh, like I have crappy pictures of some of this stuff. Uh, museums are really stingy at actually, uh, analyzing their artifacts and properly photographing them and making them open to the public. Um, so one thing I've been doing recently, kind of in the vein that you're talking about with a small shop is I've been looking at a lot of auctions sites. Uh, like the Juilliard auction site, Rock Island, um, some of the European auction sites to actually get like really good photographs of supposedly antique blades uh, and to kind of get their basic measurements because they usually give you a lot more detail than museums. Wow. Cool. Well, we cool. are running way over time. Um, yeah, we're definitely over time. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's good. Yeah, it's good. Uh, uh, it's a sign of everyone's interest. Um, so I'll just uh, end and, you know, we can hang around afterwards and chat if, if you've got time, but I want to, you know, give you a chance to, to duck out if you need to. Uh, uh, but uh, just want to take, uh, you know, the time to thank you, Ken, for your time and your expertise and talking to us about swords.